Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Alison Duxbury and I am the Deputy Dean and currently the Acting Dean of Melbourne Law School. And it is my immense pleasure to welcome you this evening to this book launch for a book published by our uh, Associate Professor Alicia Blackham, uh, Reforming Age Discrimination Law Beyond Individual Enforcement. Um, and this is a book which has been published by Oxford University Press. Um, I want to begin, as we always do on such occasions, by acknowledging that I am currently located on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, the traditional owners of the land on which I'm working today, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I also acknowledge that many of us are in other parts of Australia, and I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands on which you are all meeting today, whether it is in Melbourne or elsewhere around the world. Um, and I extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. So Alicia's book published um, during the pandemic, which is an amazing achievement in itself. Um, publishing a book at any time is an amazing achievement, but particularly at this um, time. And it is a very timely comparative analysis of age discrimination law in employment in Australia, the United Kingdom and Canada. Age discrimination in the workplace is uncomfortably common and last year, a report by the World Health Organization identified ageism as a global challenge that leads to poorer health, social isolation, and earlier deaths, which can cost economies billions. On a more personal level, age discrimination can profoundly affect a person's confidence, as well as their psychological and physical well being. So Alicia's gap, which uh, book, which is extremely timely, identifies a gap in age discrimination law across three jurisdictions and proposes compelling ideas for legal reform to improve workplaces and employment conditions for people of all ages. And this book also closely aligns with the University of Melbourne's overarching research strategy, which seeks to pursue grand challenges, three grand challenges. And it speaks to all of those challenges, understanding our place and purpose, fostering health and well-being, and support, supporting sustainability and resilience. And advancing social equity is a critical aspect of this strategy. And this book is highly aligned to these institutional priorities. So it is enormous congratulations for Alicia on this timely and fascinating book. And we're joined by a number of people who are going to contribute by speaking to uh, this book today. And for that purpose, I'm going to hand over to Professor Beth Kays, who is chairing today's discussion. And Beth has a number of different roles um, at Melbourne Law School, but for this purpose, she teaches equality and discrimination law and international employment and equality law at Melbourne Law School. And she's also the co-director of studies of our Centre for Employment and Labor Relations Law. And so I would now like to hand over to Beth to chair today's book launch and discussion. Thank you, Beth. Thanks very much, Alison. Um, and hello to everybody who's here. So I'm very pleased to be here to chair the launch of Alicia's book on reforming age discrimination law. Um, I'd like to begin also by acknowledging um, the Indigenous people on whose lands we're meeting. And I'm um, on the Wurundjeri country um, of the people of the Kulin Nation. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present, and also to acknowledge that the land was never ceded. Um, and there's a lot of outstanding business to be resolved in that context. Um, Alicia's book is the product of nearly seven years of work using multiple methods to investigate the situation of age discrimination law um, in the countries that she covers, Australia, the UK and Canada. Um, and it combines analysis of case law and legislation with empirical work and interviews and theoretical work on the justifications for age discrimination law as well. It's a very comprehensive treatment of the topic, 
Um, and in Australia, what's interesting is that age discrimination has very limited visibility in the legal system. So there are very few cases and of those very few succeed. Um, and this occurs in age, in the age context at a level even more extreme than other areas of anti-discrimination law like race, sex or disability discrimination. And so as a result, we know very little about how the law operates and its potential to help victims of age discrimination. Um, in age discrimination, recruitment and obtaining employment take on greater importance than in most other areas, because it is one of the major areas of age discrimination, particularly for older workers. It means that age discrimination is most strongly affected by the pure difficulty of proving the elements of direct discrimination in the employment context without having some sort of a shifting onus to assist in producing the evidence that would help uh, with making employment decision making more accountable. So as a result, the adverse action provisions of the Fair Work Act so far have proved to be of more assistance um, than the prohibitions of direct discrimination in the context of seeking employment. My interest, I have to confess, is not only in age discrimination, but in the other areas in which discrimination and harassment are significant, so race, sex and disability, as well as the many other attributes covered in state and territory laws. And I think there's a great deal that can be learned for these areas from Alicia's detailed study of age discrimination law. So I'm looking forward to hearing from our expert panel members, and I'm sure you are too. I'm going to introduce them all now so that we can hear from them without interruption and then move to our Q&A session at the end. So if you have questions as we go through, please put them into the Q&A or the chat or you could put your hand up and I will call on you at the end and you'll be able to ask the question yourself. Um, we're going to now move to hearing from Alicia for five minutes and then move on to hear from the panel and each speaker will speak for 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to introduce them now in the order of their speaking. So first of all, we have Emeritus Professor Ros Croucher, who is the President of the Australian Human Rights Commission. She began her seven year term on the 30th of July, 2017. Uh, before she has a very distinguished uh, CV. So before joining the commission, she was president of the Australian Law Reform Commission from 2009 to 2017 and commissioner of the ALRC from 2006 to 2009. She led a number of significant law reform inquiries there, including among other topics, age barriers to work, disability laws, encroachment on freedoms in Commonwealth laws and elder abuse. She was awarded the Women Lawyers Association of New South Wales Lifetime Achievement Award in 2019. Uh, before she moved into law reform, um, Ros had a distinguished career in legal education with 25 years in universities, including from as Dean of Macquarie University Law School from 1999 to 2007 um, and of Sydney Law School from 1997 to 1998. Um, and interestingly, her academic areas were principally in the fields of equity, trusts, property, inheritance and legal history, which is not the most obvious background for, um, for human rights, but it's a very obvious background for the Law Reform Commission, I think. I'd like to introduce the Honourable Tony North QC. It's Tony's birthday today, so best wishes to him for a birthday. Um, it's very fitting for a seminar on ageing, but I have to admit that we're all doing that. Um, so. Tony is the chairperson of the Victorian Law Reform Commission. He has a distinguished career spanning 45 years. Um, he's a former judge of the Federal Court and the Supreme Court of the ACT. He was admitted to the Victorian Bar in 1976 and appointed QC in 1989. Uh, in 1995, he was appointed to the judge of the Federal, appointed to the Federal Court of Australia, um, where he served until he retired in 2018. And also from 2004, um, as an additional judge of the Supreme Court of the ACT. Um, so he was appointed chair of the Victorian Law Reform Commission in 2019. We also have with us Emeritus Professor Andrew Burns from the Australian Human Rights Institute in the Faculty of Law and Justice at University of New South Wales. Andrew joined the UNSW faculty as a professor in May 2005. And pri prior to that, he was a professor of law at ANU from 2001 to 2005. Um, and before that, an associate professor at the Faculty of Law University of Hong Kong, where he was a director of the Centre for Comparative and Public Law and director of the Master of Laws in Human Rights. His areas of expertise include international law, human rights law, in particular gender and disability and discrimination law. 
We also have as our final speaker, Juan Tran, who's the principal solicitor at the Young Workers Centre in Melbourne. This is a one-stop shop for young workers who want to learn more about their rights at work or who need assistance with resolving workplace issues. The team of lawyers organising, organises educators and researchers uh, seek to empower young people working in Victoria with the knowledge and skills needed to end workplace exploitation and insecurity. So we have a very eminent panel uh, to speak to us today. And as I've said, uh, they've each got 10 minutes to speak. So uh, without more, I will hand over to Ros Croucher, the President of the Human Rights Commission. Thank you. Um, Alicia, were you going to speak first? I, I think you were scheduled to have a short talk now. So go That's ahead. That's right. If you like, Ros, I can start and just frame it a little bit yeah. and then lead into thank the you. panel. Um, thank you so much, Beth and Alison, for that wonderful introduction. I'm so grateful to have you all here today and to this wonderful panel uh, who are going to help us reflect on the book and where we go from here. Um, this book, as Beth has said, is the culmination of a multi-year research project. And I wanted to start by gratefully acknowledging the funding to do this work, which came from the Australian Research Council as part of the Discovery Project Scheme, but also in a somewhat side project um, from the Swedish Research Council uh, to extend this work to Sweden, uh, which didn't make it into the book, but I also acknowledge the funding from Ford. The book maps the difficulty of trying to address age discrimination using our current legal framework. It maps the prevalence of age discrimination at work, which tends to be subtle, not overt, but also internalized by people of all sorts of different ages. And what that means is it's particularly difficult to enforce age discrimination law, perhaps more so than discrimination law relating to any other protected characteristic. It maps the difficulties of using the legal framework, uh, using the lens of naming, blaming and claiming to look at how disputes might evolve, but also looking at how we use alternative dispute resolution to resolve claims and then proceeding to the courts. It maps the barriers and how they accelerate as claims progress. And by the end of this offers some sort of explanation for why age discrimination complaints and cases might be so rare. What I conclude by looking at this empirical material and also the doctrinal case law is that the law isn't helping those who are actually most affected by discrimination and age discrimination in particular. And even with the limited data that we have in this area, we can see really significant gaps for young people, particularly, which is why I'm so glad that Juan is here today, but also for older women who are perhaps over affected by age discrimination. So those who are most affected tend not to use the legal mechanisms that we have in place. Acknowledging these problems, the book puts forward reforms, both to support individual claims and help people use the legal framework, but also to move beyond our reliance on individual claiming, recognizing that individual complaints are never going to solve the systemic problems that we have. The book argues we need a stronger role for our statutory agencies, both through stronger powers, but also through better resourcing for their complex and diverse roles, that we need to enhance collective action uh, by unions, but also by other non-governmental organizations and just groups of workers as well, recognizing that these problems are generally not just about one person, they are systemic and group-based. It also argues that we need to better use positive duties to prompt proactive organizational change. So rather than relying on responses that are reactive, we need to move beyond that to be proactive and actually prompt change initially to prevent discrimination from occurring. I argue that these reforms work best together. So we cannot just focus on supporting individual claimants or positive duties. Actually, they are all mutually reinforcing and supporting. And so these reforms work best as essentially a holistic package. But also, I think the book is a call to action to reprioritize age equality. It argues that while we might have um, some conflicts or tensions in the way we see age discrimination, actually it's really essential to address it because age is an amplifier of other forms of inequality and a problem in and of itself. So it is a call to action for governments, for statutory equality agencies, for unions, but also employers to take action, to prioritize age equality and to proactively prevent discrimination. These are issues relating to age discrimination law, but they are not unique to age. So I think this is a challenge for all of us to reform discrimination law to meaningfully advance equality. 
And with that, I hand over to our really excellent panel and thank you all for being here. Thanks, Alicia. Um, Beth is our moderator. I'll just pick up the baton and run with it. Um, I'd uh, uh, like to thank you all for including me on the panel and I'll begin by acknowledging where I am, which is on the Darragon Gundagara people's land in the Blue Mountains, west of Sydney. And I add my acknowledgement to all of those that have been given so far. Um, I'm really honored to be part of this panel and to be here in this virtual book launch of uh, your book, Alicia, um, published in the very prestigious Oxford Labour Law series by Oxford University Press. Um, first, I should say it is a fine book. Even, even before you get to page one in Arabic numbering, you find a set of endorsements that would make any author blush. Phrases like must read, go to resource, groundbreaking, an outstanding contribution leap off the, the page. This is in addition to the usual accolades you would expect to find in an ac academic book like meticulous research, scrupulous comparative doctrinal research with meticulous empirical case studies, sophisticated account, nuanced understanding, impressive socio-legal study. It is, as Professor Colm Okaneda acclaims, a remarkably good book. I was particularly encouraged to see Alicia's list of reform ideas integrated throughout the book and then brought together as an appendix at the end. I'm honoured today to be in the company of Emeritus Professor Andrew Burns, a tireless advocate and champion in the field of the rights of older people in particular. And for our moderator inquisitor to be Professor Beth Gaze, let me say I am terrified already. The Honourable Anthony North, now Casey and I are compatriots in the field of law reform and Tony brings his years on the bench to the discussion. It is humbling to be in all their company. What can I bring in such eminent company on the important discussion of the topic of age discrimination? Well, one thing I learned in my years of law reforming endeavours, 10 years at the ALRC and now five years at the Australian Human Rights Commission, is to acknowledge the expertise of others, to learn from them and draw the best of it all together in contributions to law reform. Whatever the topic of consideration, attributing the wisdom to all those who informed those conclusions and aiming for the long horizon. On Human Rights Day last year, 2021, I released the first part of a roadmap for human rights reform in Australia under the banner of free and equal and Australian conversation on human rights. And what we were speaking of was the commission's position paper on federal discrimination law reform. We set out 38 recommendations covering every aspect of our federal discrimination law system to ensure that it offers robust protection against discrimination, provides better support for businesses and organisations to do the right thing, and is simpler to use. The position paper will form part of a report to the Attorney General in due course, together with the major second set piece, providing a revised and revamped model for a federal charter of rights for Australia. The discrimination law paper builds from and lifts conceptually higher than the proposals in the Respect at Work report, which focused on the response to sexual harassment in the workplace through the Sex Discrimination Act Commonwealth. And with respect to attribution, there is much of it in the 350 pages of the discrimination law paper, including to the work of Alicia, Beth, and others who have advocated for using regulatory theory and models to reimagine and reform discrimination law. Law reform work of this kind in the discrimination paper is not like an academic paper in its use of referencing. Key sources are named rather than the cite everything approach that is often required in demonstrating the comprehensiveness of doctrinal literature review. But using citation as some indicator within this constrained context, we cite Alicia 29 times, and this was before the publication of the book that we speak of tonight, and Beth 89. 
In the few minutes I have in this part of the proceedings, I would like to provide a snapshot of our conclusions in the context of Australia's anti-discrimination laws. As our jurisdiction is wider than employment and reaches public life in general, the scope is necessarily wider than the central focus of Alicia's study. In our conclusions, you will see that their provenance is strongly grounded in the theoretical literature that Alicia draws from and enhances in her book. It would not surprise this audience to say that there are a number of key problems of dis in discrimination law in Australia. Above all, we need to move beyond individual enforcement, which is the subtitle to Alicia's book. First, addressing discrimination is heavily reliant on individuals to, to bring complaints rather than on more systemic approaches to building cultures of prevention. This is very much a feature of first generation approaches to discrimination law. The focus should shift to preventing discrimination rather than reacting to it after the fact. Secondly, the regulatory framework is out of date and needs strengthening. Federal discrimination laws just do not provide adequate support to the business sector to take proactive efforts, efforts to address potential discrimination. And thirdly, the discrimination system, while offering a range of options, can be very difficult to navigate and legal remedies difficult to access, with the result that many meritorious claims may not be pursued in the courts. So individuals need the tools to get access to justice and with now four sets of federal discrimination laws alongside state and territory instruments and overlapping regimes such as fair work, the mix is complex, which leads to difficulties in application. There are also gaps in protection, so many people are not protected or unable to obtain access to a remedy. So what are the solutions? I crystallised these into four pillars which are quite like Alicia's structure in her book. So great minds think alike. And, and indeed, Beth and, Beth and Andrew and Tony, other great minds similarly would think in this um, framework. Um, building a preventative culture, modernizing the regulatory framework, enhancing accident, access to justice, and improving the practical operation of laws. Many, um, uh, um, you find quite a, a lot of consideration of amending the practical operation, but actually to think higher, to reconceptualize through a, a better regulatory um, uh, model is actually the, 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 the key, I think, to getting people on board and understanding where we need to shift. So just distilling those in, in, in a couple of minutes, the. The positive duty framework is the essence of the preventative focus. These are not new ideas, as you all know. I, I just want to give you um, a, uh, an example of um, how it might be expressed in a simple way. When we were advocating this approach, uh, certainly in respect of work, but then in the discriminal paper, we um, recommend it for the whole suite of discriminal laws was interesting to see the Business Council of Australia coming on board very strongly because the focus on preventing, which is the essence of the occupational health and safety approach, builds a different mindset for business um, more generally. And the example that they use, which I'll share, was um, the lettuce leaf example. And it was Jennifer Westcott, Westacott who said, we have to think of the lettuce leaf equivalent in discrimination law. So the lettuce leaf um, um, in a supermarket, um, uh, somebody sees a lettuce leaf on the floor, they pick it up. If they don't, someone might be injured or there might be a complaint if someone slips on the, the lettuce leaf. In the discrimination law context, we've got to think of it in what a preventive focus is. Part of it is getting that there is a lettuce leaf on the floor at all and what that lettuce leaf might look like. So there's a lot of understanding about the dynamics so that people not only have the systems in place so there are not lettuce leaves on the floor or situations where discrimination can happen, but rather that it's all thought of in the upstream way. Um, a positive duty is a strong measure of your work, Alicia, and it's also the foundation pillar of the preventative focus in our discriminal work. 
The second pillar, modernizing the regulatory framework, obviously brings in the, the fact that the um, complaint system is all at the bottom of any regulatory model. It's only at the level of persuasion with, with um, uh, no other powers of enforcement at all. Um, so we use that model to build a whole structure of regulation, not necessarily um, um, going up, way up the tree, but certainly more effective than it is now. Um, and using the Regulatory Powers Act, which is something that, that other federal agencies were um, given, but the Human Rights Commission was left um, outside the door. Um, and here, I just want to add one dynamic into that. And, it's, and it goes to the enhancing access to justice, which is our third pillar. Um, we explore in the paper the missing element in the federal structure of um, enforcement, which is the absence of a tribunal layer. The states and territories have access to civil and administrative tribunals. There used to be a layer like that in the federal structure, but it was taken away in 2000. And I explore in the paper how taking that away has led to an absence of access to justice um, at the federal level. And it's created all manner of, of complications in terms of um, a lack of um, uh, a lack of any jurisprudence to, to build a sense of what the dynamics are, apart from the fewer than 3% of matters that end up in court. Um, it leads to the, the, the um, problems about access when the federal court is so expensive. Um, we also need to ensure that representative complaints can be carried through in the same way federally. That's going to happen in, in, um, the, uh, on the back of the respective work implementation, which is a good thing. Um, uh, the final section picks up a whole lot of the, the, the various aspects of technicality and costs and, and, and other things that are the bête noir of anybody working in the, the, the discrimination law area. So look, I think I've well and truly used my 10 minutes. Re the national reform of our discrimination law arena is long overdue. There was some good, uh, good work went in in, in the um, consolidation um, in 10 years ago, we need to pick that up again. And I think that the paper we produced at the end of last year is a thoughtful contribution to that area and draw strongly from the eminent people in this room. So um, good on you, Alicia, for your excellent book. It is a fine book indeed. Thanks very much, Roz, for that. Um, and I certainly agree with your um, commenting the book. Um, so I think next we hear from Tony North. Thanks very much, Beth. Um, and like you, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I presently sit. But also like you, like to add that few words that you did about unfinished business, because it's um, important to recognise that there's the, the overhang of injustice still exists and mere acknowledgement really doesn't go far enough. Um, well, I want to thank you, Alicia, for the invitation to contribute to the launch of reforming age discrimination law. I feel rather privileged to be able to participate in the discussion. Um, and congratulations also, and I add this hyperbole to the list that Ros referred to, but I see it as a very high quality contribution to learning in the area. I was particularly impressed by the logic and coherence in the development of the argument. And you can imagine this is something that uh, in the work of the Law Reform Commission is really essential, that the, that the concepts hang together. Um, you start with a picture of how widespread age discrimination in the workplace is, and then address the limitations on individual enforcement the reasons for those limitations and how individual enforcement could be improved. Then you explain how collective enforcement is a better option and why at present collective enforcement is not working well. Finally, you set out ways in which collective enforcement could be made to work better. Um, I also appreciate the quality of the company I'm in and starting with Ros, who's set the bar very high with um, a, a template which uh, I will try and fill in 
only by some very small but significant examples, I think. Um, there are many issues raised in the book which capture my interest. I've chosen two, each of which reflects the different phases of my career, first as a judge and then as a law reformer, and which, if improved, would make a significant difference to wage discrimination law. The first concerns the reverse onus of proof, and the second concerns the enforcement of positive duties. Turning to the reverse onus, it is central to an employment discrimination case that the court finds the employer acted in a discriminatory way. It is notoriously easy for an employer to bury the discrimination under uh, ostensibly lawful reasons, such as the requirements of the workplace. Unless the employer has been careless in disclosing the true reason, it will be difficult for the employee to establish the prohibited motivation as part of the case in chief. For this reason, federal industrial legislation has since inception in 1904 provided for a, a reverse onus of proof the statute requires the employer to establish the non-discriminatory motivation once the employee has made a prima facie case. As Alicia points out, the state discrimination legislation does not provide for a reverse onus. She recommends that the reverse onus should be introduced into state legislation. She calls it an obvious reform. I hope our Attorney General reads what he says and what will work. It will not change the result in all cases. He points out that there will still be cases where the employee will not be able to establish even a prima facie case. Further, she was told by some whom she consulted that reversing the onus might generate sympathy for the employer and thereby sway the court in favour of the employer. I doubt that because the reason for the reversal is that the employer is often the only repository of evidence of the motivation. My experience is that the reverse onus in the federal statute is a very powerful instrument in the courtroom setting. It was not unusual to see the cases of high-handed employers spurred on by overconfident, in lawyer, uh, overconfident lawyers crumble in a heap when the employer witness floundered in the witness box when cross-examined about motivation. Without the reverse onus, that witness would not have needed to enter the witness box at all, and the case would likely have been lost. Of course, the reverse onus is especially effective in favour of employees where the employee is only required to establish that the discrimination is one of the motivating factors. But that does not mean the reverse onus operates like a magic wand. In a 2014 article in the University of New South Wales Law Journal, written by Anna Chapman, Kathleen Love and Beth, following the Barclay case, the divergent views about the scope of the inquiry by the court of an employer's motivation is explored and the long history of the difference in views is explained. Nonetheless, the reverse onus answers the demand of justice because the knowledge of the motivation for discrimination lies hidden in the mind of the employer. It is the employer which should carry the burden of proof on that issue. Much work to be done at the state level um, on um, inserting a reverse onus in the discrimination legislation, both for age discrimination and in the other areas. Turning to the question of the um, enforceable duty, Alicia makes the case for improving collective enforcement by legislating for, enfor for an enforceable duty to eliminate age discrimination at work. She describes how Victoria, Queensland, Tasmania and the ACT have some form of positive duty that have extremely limited means of enforcement of that duty. 
Victoria is a relevant example. Section 15 of the Equal Opportunity Act provides for a, po a positive duty to eliminate discrimination. The section was introduced in 2010 following the 2008 Gardner Report. The report recommended that the Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission have power to issue compliance notices where it found that the duty was breached and suggested a power to apply to VCAT for an order requiring compliance. The government did not accept the enforcement recommendations. Furthermore, VCAT has decided that Section 15 does not provide a private cause of action. The Commission is thus today left only with the power to investigate, which, as I understand it, has not been used through lack of resources. However, Alicia's work adds to the growing call for effective mechanisms of enforcement of positive duties. In 2020, the Australian Human Rights Commission's Respected Work Inquiry recommended a compliance notice procedure in aid of a duty to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate sexual discrimination. The recommendation also provided for the Commission to apply to a court for an order requiring compliance with the duty. Then, late last year, in my own Commission's Improving the Justice System Response Sex Offences Report, we recommended enforcement measures along the same lines in aid of the Section 15 duty and also in aid of an extended duty from sexual harassment to sexual violence. In both these areas of the reverse onus and the enforceability of positive duties, Alicia's work adds force to the arguments in favour of reform. Particularly in the case of enforceability, the strength of her arguments and the increasing body of law reform agency support promises to nudge the country towards collective enforcement and thereby reduce the limitations on individual enforcement, which Alicia so skillfully describes. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Tony. That was um, excellent, highlighting a couple of really important areas. Um, I hand over now to Andrew. Thanks very much, uh, Beth. And I'm too, I'm delighted to take part in this event to celebrate uh, the publication of Alicia's uh, book. I'm speaking to you, uh, to you this evening from the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation in Sydney, and I pay my respects to their elders past and pre present and endorse the other comments that have been made. It's a real honor to join this panel of leading scholars and practitioners who are experts in the field. At the outset, let me congratulate Alicia, as others have done on the publication of what is a major contribution to the literature on discrimination law and age discrimination. There is, of course, as already noted, a considerable body of literature examining the limitations of the legal frameworks that we have adopted in Australia and comparable jurisdictions to address different forms of discrimination. However, Alicia's book makes important and innovative contributions on the empirical, theoretical and policy levels it should certainly stimulate deep reflection and policy change. In recent years, there have been concerted efforts at the international level to persuade states that a new international convention on the human rights of older persons is required. And I want to speak about the implications of, of that for uh, the things we're talking about tonight. The gist of the argument is that violations of human rights on the basis of older age are widespread and persistent that the existing human rights standards and mechanisms are conceptually and operationally deficient in responding to those violations, and that a new dedicated treaty would make a significant positive contribution to addressing them. I'd urge all of you to support the campaign for such, uh, such a treaty by adding your voices to the many civil society organisations and individuals who've urged the Australian government to support this endeavour. Today's panel gives me the opportunity to offer some reflections on the lessons that Alicia's work offers to those involved in the international campaign, and equally the lessons from the international analysis and advocacy for how we might do better in addressing age discrimination at the national level. My thoughts are no doubt quixotic and may well muddy the clear waters uh, so uh, ably described and set out by Alicia. 
The most obvious difference between the international campaign and the discussion of domestic age discrimination law that we're having tonight is the types of age discrimination that are covered. The international campaign is dominated by a focus on discrimination against older persons or discrimination in older age, terms which are difficult to define, but which refer to persons in the later stages of their life. On the other hand, domestic legislation generally protects against discrimination on the basis of age at any stage of life. Lysia's lucid discussion of the different theoretical justifications for age discrimination law shows how the justificatory starting point influences the form and content of the legislation eventually adopted. Even though the Commonwealth Age Discrimination Act of 2004 refers in its objects clause to the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging of 2002, which focuses primarily on older persons, the legislation is largely underpinned by the notion that every individual has a right not to be discriminated against on the basis of ageist and stereotypes and inaccurate or relevant assumptions, whatever age they may be. It's not confined to older age. It does not really articulate a power dominance-based approach to the problem of dis age discrimination and how it may affect different cohorts differently. Age discrimination is portrayed in broad terms as a wrong that is essentially the same for persons of any age who encounter it. By contrast, the international advocacy starts from a different justification, namely that discrimination against older persons on the basis of their, of their older age has distinctive features that make it a deserving subject for specific regulation. This approach is based on the social reality that the meaning of aging in low, later life is socially constructed, and older age is generally seen as a time of decline, deficit, and lack of adaptability. The ageism directed against and internalized by older persons is thus qualitatively, qualitatively different from ageism directed against younger people on the basis of their relatively younger age. While both types of ageism lead to unfair treatment, their nature and impact are in important respects different, and this needs to be acknowledged in policy and legislative responses. As Alison Duxbury has already mentioned, the Global Report on Ageism released last year by the World Health Organization and other UN entities, which dealt with all forms of ageism, made both the commonalities and the differences very clear. The second difference in approach between Australia's domestic legislation and the international approach in relation to age discrimination is that the domestic approach is essentially a non-discrimination approach as opposed to a human rights approach. This may seem an odd thing to say. After all, are not non-discrimination and equality fundamental human rights standards and principles? I use the terms to underline the fact that Australia's laws are largely still comparator based with the wrongs to be redressed thus necessarily re refracted through an anti-discrimination lens. The often poor record of Australian courts in this and other areas of discrimination law to open up to a broader understanding of the power dynamics and social structures that exclude, marginalise and disadvantage particular groups has not helped. International advocates certainly call for guarantees of equality and non-discrimination on the basis of older age, and these will be included in any new instrument and will be defined broadly. But they also wish to see inclusion of guarantees of the range of individual human rights that appear in other instruments, tailored to the specific circumstances of diverse older populations. The lessons from the international human rights experience to date has been if you don't explicitly mention older persons and their specific circumstances, they will be largely ignored. Similarly, in the Australian context, it's far from clear that the enactment of generally worded Human Rights Act in the ACT, Victoria and Queensland has yet generated a significant focus on the rights of older persons in those contexts. If such a thematically focused human rights framework were incorporated in a full-blooded manner into Australian domestic law, it might provide the opportunity to move by beyond the rather straightened analysis that has so often plagued discrimination law interpretation in this country. The judicial and legal culture with its sometimes unfortunate parochialism and narrowness of interpretive vision may still limit the potential of such norms, even if they're translated into domestic law. But the problem at the moment in moving towards such a goal uh, to the reform of domestic law is the lack of a comprehensive and coherent statement of human rights in older age at either a national or international level. This is to be contrasted with the areas of racial discrimination, discrimination against women, the rights of the child, the rights of persons with disabilities, and the rights of indigenous peoples. 
This is why the elaboration of a comprehensive international treaty on the subject is so important to addressing ageism, age discrimination, and the violation of the rights of older persons in all their forms, both internationally and nationally. Such an approach might challenge an approach which sees a primary focus on an enlightened, progressive anti-discrimination model, even with better enforcement procedures. This might see that as too limiting. A final point where the findings of Alicia's research and international developments are in agreement is the need to think creatively about how we implement standards prohibiting age discrimination more effectively. The limitations of individual complaint-based systems are well known and the effects to move away, the efforts to move away from a sclerotic judicialization of alternative procedures in Australia have had some, although not complete success. Thus the focus on a positive duty, a focus on prevention and on different forms of regulatory response are welcome and are certainly consonant with the right to remedy and corresponding state, state obligations under the international law of human rights. And indeed we might think uh, about looking more at the range of creative remedies uh, that have been have developed under international law of human rights. But equally importantly is the broader issue of looking beyond discrimination law, as Alicia notes in her book. Ageism is a broad social problem that needs to be addressed by a wide range of measures that must include, but also go well beyond legal, legal prescriptions. International law offers us guidance on the types of measures that might be adopted, both in relation to the rights of older persons, but also in other areas. In conclusion, the data, the analysis, and the 51 recommendations for policy and legislative change that Alicia puts forward in this book are a stimulating and important contribution to a necessary discussion about how we fix a deficient system. Congratulations, Alicia, on the publication of this important book. It's a terrific achievement. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. And so now to the cold face, to Juan. Thank you. Um, I also pay my deep respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we all meet. For me, it's the Wurundjeri people of the mighty Kulin Nation. Um, uh, this always was, always will be Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander land. So as mentioned at the beginning, the Young Workers Centre is a one-stop shop for young workers aged 30 and under. Well, we define them as being aged 30 and under um, to learn more about their workplace rights or who need assistance resolving workplace issues. Since we were launched in 2016, we've spoken to over 35,000 students in school um, and apprentices in, in trade school or TAFE. Um, we've assisted more than 2,600 young workers with their workplace issues, and we've recovered almost $2 million in reimbursed unpaid wages and other entitlements, um, but also in compensation for unfair termination of employment um, and sexual harassment and discrimination matters. We represent young people from many backgrounds, including temporary migrants in Australia. Um, and we have particular expertise in representing and campaigning with apprentices, which is a current campaign that we're running. Um, I've personally been excited by this research since I first learned of it, was um, honoured to participate in, in um, interviews with Alicia uh, at the beginning of COVID. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here in this illustrious company to help launch this important work, which both explains the problems, um, but excitingly for me as an activist um, and a practitioner and a pragmatist, um, proffers some really concrete solutions. I think when we think about age discrimination, we often think and talk about how it affects older people, but it equally affects young people. Um, for young people, the law itself is discriminatory and Alyssa's book clearly draws this out and points some of them, um, points directly to some of them. For me and the work we do at the Young Workers Centre, the first thing that springs to mind is junior rates of pay. What are junior rates? They are rates of pay that are entirely age-based, irrespective of the work being performed. Under many of our modern awards, um, juniors are defined as being aged 21 years old and under. Um, and the minimum rates of pay for juniors as defined are then listed as a percentage of the minimum for that particular classification. So awards already have skill classifications level, which uh, they should be, the skill classification levels should be the thing that determine rates of pay, not age. Um, but the existence of junior rates of pay uh, facilitates acceptance of age discrimination in the workplace. 
So too, our laws around superannuation contributions, where an employer only has to pay contributions for a worker who's under the age of 18, if they work more than 30 hours per week. Um, we had a recent change in our superannuation laws to remove one particular barrier for all people. And it was an opportunity to remove this particular barrier as well. Um, but we did not sadly take up that opportunity. Um, we never interrogated our policy reason for why we have this uh, additional requirement for workers who are under the age of 18. Um, and if we save for our retirement, our entire working life, and our working life begins before 18, why can we not start saving for it at that age? So again, this is a law that entrenches and facilitates age discrimination and ageism. Um, but as, uh, as I um, think about this, you know, I've joked before that we, we grow out of, um, we, we grow out of this entrenched uh, legal age discrimination. But in addition to age discrimination being entrenched in our laws, young workers come to us at the Young Workers Centre with problems in their workplace. They do not necessarily use the terminology of age discrimination, but they describe it exactly. Um, effectively, it's naming in Alicia's book. Um, and I guess uh, hearing from um, the Business Council uh, through Roz, it's pointing out the lettuce leaf. Um, they lose their job or shifts when they turn 18. They have wages withheld um, be, until after they've demonstrated to their employer that they have a savings account um, and that the wages will be paid into that savings account and that they've got a savings plan. That is an actual example of someone who's come to us. Um, we've uh, had workers being told off for buying their lunch instead of bringing it from home, being bullied for acne scars, um, and getting told off for being insufficiently prepared when one young worker got her period at work. Um, this worker was required to suffer the embarrassment of an obviously stained uniform instead of being permitted to go buy supplies when she worked in a health industry clinic, which was inside a shopping centre near a supermarket. It would have taken her no more than 10 minutes to leave and to return. Um, and this is another thing Alicia's book does so well, which is to talk about the intersectionalities of, uh, of age, discrimin age discrimination and how it connects to or is, is um, magnified or magnifies other forms of discrimination. For us at the Young Workers Centre, unfortunately, uh, we see more and more um, claims relating to sexual harassment, um, which are very strongly connected to uh, age discrimination or ageism. There are also matters where it's not so squarely age discrimination, but is probably, but, but is likely to be. Um, and uh, uh, examples of things like comments about poor attitudes or comments about people not wanting to work hard or comments about senses of entitlement or desires to be influencers instead of performing some other job that we might consider to require harder work or be of greater value. Um, despite all these stories that have come to us, we have never had a client who wished to pursue their age discrimination matter. Young workers may and they blame, but claiming is problematic. And it's problematic as acknowledged by um, everyone else and certainly acknowledged in Alicia's work. Individual enforcement of rights is substandard. Um, the, the mechanism is too great a burden to be placed upon the person experiencing the discrimination. Um, we aim to take a holistic approach to solving problems that young workers might experience at work. We do that by providing them with knowledge about their workplace rights, including their rights under equality law. We provide them with some tools to fix those problems, which include things like organizing and getting together with other workers, the kind of collective approaches that Alicia encourages in, in her suggested reforms. Um, we, while we acknowledge the, the agency and the power in, in having individual rights. We believe in the greater power of the collective to resolve issues in a holistic and proactive manner. So to prevent discrimination from happening. During COVID um, and uh, the JobKeeper that was implemented in April-ish um, of 2020, um, JobKeeper itself became an operation of age discrimination for our cohort 
So many young workers lost work, but were locked out of JobKeeper for ostensibly objective purposes um, due to being casual employees. Um, or their, simpl- their employer chose not to apply for JobKeeper on their behalf um, and sometimes articulated reasons for that that were clearly or appeared to be um, based on uh, age stereotypes. One employer who employed mostly under 18 year olds told their workers that they didn't need JobKeeper and they could just go and live at home if they needed to pay rent. Um, So to go back and live with their parents if that was the the problem. Um, In a number of workplaces, we got workers together um, and with facilitation and assistance by us, we succeeded in uh, persuading their employer to apply for JobKeeper payments on their behalf. Another reason why we find it uh, difficult to encourage young workers to claim um, age discrimination is that our adversarial legal system tends to re-victimise people. Um, So I strongly appreciate Alicia's call to action and list of 51 reforms. I want to draw out three that I particularly love, and that's not to diminish any of the other at all. Um, The first is data collection. Who doesn't love data? Um, someone said, you don't count if you're not counted. We do a lot of data collection at Young Works Centre. We use it to structure our campaigns um, and we use it to demonstrate the extent of a problem. And that forms the basis of being able to make a persuasive argument for reform. Uh, and this is what Alicia has done so well in, in the book. Um, so much information about how Um, our current systems and the systems in the UK and Canada uh, are are not not up to scratch. Um, Also, the limit on the use of non-disclosure agreements and confidentiality agreements in settlement discussions. Um, We we find that the use of confidentiality in settlement discussions are so paradigmatic that suggesting otherwise can derail settlement um, negotiations. it's certainly been suggested to me during mediations, conferences, that requesting that settlements not be confidential is an example of bad faith negotiation. And that's been suggested to me by mediators, conciliators, um, judicial officers, and less surprisingly, my opposition, but it is so entrenched in how we practice law and how we negotiate and, and do alternative dispute resolution that pushing back against it at an individual level is nigh on impossible. Um, And lastly, but perhaps uh, most importantly, and certainly something that everyone else has pointed out, is about the positive duties inequality law being absolutely necessary. It shifts the burden off individuals. It allows allows for proactive and preventative steps to be taken. Um, And it it allows for subtle or minor or less harmful forms of discrimination to be addressed. Um, But as uh, as pointed out, under Victoria's Equal Opportunity Act, there is a positive duty, but it doesn't have any cause of action that attaches to it. It doesn't have any um, abilities for a person, a union, an organisation um, to, to enforce action to be taken under the positive duty. Um, the only body that has uh, the ability to, to do anything under the positive duty is the Victorian Opportunity and Rights Commission um, to investigate. Um, and it's only exercised its power once, to my knowledge, in the 12 years that it's had this power. Um, and it commenced an investigation into Baker's Delight for um, potential breach of its positive duties um, in relation to sexual harassment. Uh, And to get a sense of how resource intensive this was for the commission, uh, it began discussions about the the investigation prior to 2019. It commenced in 2020 and it released its report in August of this year. So a two year investigation um, and the as far as I'm aware, the only time that they exercised um, their duty. So all these things together, all these 51 reforms, um, we we need to carefully look at them and see what we can push to to be implemented 
um, in Australia. Um, I love a call to action, um, Alicia. Um, I will answer it and I hope we all do. Thank you. Thanks very much, Juan. Um, so that was a series of really excellent perspectives on the book and the issues that Alicia raises. And it just reinforces very strongly, doesn't it, the need for law reforms in this area because the law's operation is really quite dysfunctional um, at the moment. Uh, it's clear from the work that you've done. Um, so we have now, um, I think about 10 to 15 minutes for some questions. Um, if anybody does, I've been checking the chat and the Q&A, but nobody has put a question in there yet. Um, so in the meantime, while we wait um, for that, I was wondering maybe, uh, Alicia, I thought it would be quite interesting to just hear you comment a little bit on what, if anything, the Swedish system does, whether you would reach the same conclusions, because I know Sweden has a more collectivised um, or corporatized system of enforcement, um, and whether you expect that will throw a bit of uh, different light on the system. It's a really interesting question, Beth, and I feel like Sweden gives us an example of what happens if we minimise or move beyond individual enforcement. And I think the, the answer to that is we can't get rid of individual enforcement. It really matters and it needs to remain part of essentially a four pillar system. So don't get rid of individual claims, but you know, we need things that work with them and complement them. Um, the Swedish system relies really heavily on their statutory equality agency, the Discrimination Ombudsman, but even more fundamentally, it's a highly unionized, very collectivist system. It relies on trade unions to do most of this work. One of the problems uh, in the age discrimination space is that unions do not prioritize age equality. And in fact, there are such strong social norms, age normative standards in the Swedish context that for unions, it's quite awkward to challenge age discrimination because it's accepted and it's normalized. So Sweden still has a statutory retirement age. Uh, it has been raised from 67 to 69 in recent reforms, but essentially older workers are omitted from employment protection in various ways from the age of 67 or 69. And that is a very accepted and in fact, you know, a part of the Swedish social security system that is seen as a positive because it means that people can take a pension and that's seen as a reward for good work and an important part of the social safety net. So there is a really strong interplay between social security norms, age norms, and this kind of minimization of discrimination in employment. Also very strong acceptance of the last in first out rule in Sweden and age-based and seniority-based wage setting. So one of the challenges is if you're relying on collective structures and trade unions to challenge things that they are accepting and actually negotiating for, um, that doesn't work so well as an enforcement system. So the challenge in Sweden is because it is so difficult to bring an individual claim, in fact, nearly impossible, um, they have even fewer cases than Australia, if you can believe it. Um, something like three or four cases on age discrimination in the Swedish system uh, since they brought the laws in. So don't get rid of individual enforcement. It really matters, particularly when age normative standards are really strongly in place. So we really do have to solve the problems in Australia, don't we? Yes, <laughs> no, we really do. No going bypassing them. <laughs> um, look, I've got two questions in the chat and I might ask this one first because I think it's um, a really interesting one, perhaps for everybody who wants to comment on it. Um, can the panel, panel talk a bit about possible use of work health and safety style mechanisms where the representatives, committees, inspection powers or duties to deal with multiple uh, enterprises and so on in the equality space? Would that be a partial solution or what, what are its limitations in relation to age discrimination? Perhaps, I don't know, if um, Alicia, if you want to comment first and then if anybody else in the panel would like to comment. I'd be really interested to hear the panel's thoughts as well. But mm. my sense is we have a lot to learn from work health and safety law. And I think obviously uh, Mel Schlager, Belinda Smith and Liam Elphick's work really puts this forward as an area that has really strong resonance uh, with discrimination and sexual harassment law. There's so much that equality lawyers need to be learning from work health and safety law and in reframing discrimination as a health risk to our mental and physical health, I think is really mm. important too. Um, as Sean points out in his question, there's, there's really significant powers that are given 
to our work health and safety inspectorates. You know, they do have the power to enter, to inspect, um, but also, you know, our trade unions and collective groups are given much stronger powers under work health and safety law. And there is a requirement to consult under work health and safety law. And I think that's a really important thing that we should be considering in the context of equality law. And one of the things that I argue is that we need to become more consultative in how we advance equality and address discrimination. So I think that's one of the key things that I would be bringing forward as well. Thank you. Um, would anyone else on the panel like to comment? Ross? The, the analogies or the parallels with work health and safety are good, but only go so far. Um, the, I, I love the way um, that lettuce leaf idea, because it, it, the problem is in the um, discrimination context is the, the nuance in the idea of seeing the lettuce leaf was how I framed it. And um, so while the, mod, the model is good in that it places the focus on the preventative responsibilities um, and, and it's a workplace thing. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's only one part of the discrimination um, jurisdiction. But if we look at workplaces, it's the, what is the lettuce leaf equivalent? Now, um, I think it's, also, it's important to distinguish the way that the fair work system operates and the way that the discrimination law jurisdiction works. There are overlaps, but the, the really, the hard stuff comes in discrimination, uh, in unlawful discrimination. They, they have all of the complexities of uh, the interactions of, of, of people that are, um, are, are much more complex and require time than do some of the fair work uh, uh, aspects of the fair work jurisdiction. In speaking with the, the fair work people, um, you know, about one of the issues that came up was, oh, look, we do, we do conciliations really fast, but then you drill down into it. And when you get to the thing that is closest to the unlawful discrimination jurisdiction, which is their anti-bullying, they said, oh, no, we can't do it that way. They are much too hard. Well, that's, that's all of the work of the Human Rights Commission when it comes to anti-discrimination. So I'm very nervous about um, sometimes pressing the fair work model as some, you know, in some respects, there are things that are really useful, but, but, um, but in some respects, there are areas that are really different and there would be an enormous loss to the value in dealing with individual complaints in a really proper way that you can with the complexity of the, the jurisdiction. But when it comes to enforcement, I agree that there are, there's, a, um, there's a lot more to be done. Um, there are some amendments in train that um, in terms of implementing respect of work, um, the uh, opportunity is there to open it up. Um, the advocacy we've done in that discriminal paper is to bring in um, much more um, uh, of the, the, the kind of middle tier, like enforcement notices and civil penalties and so on, and, and the ability to pursue, and also the ability to have systemic inquiry, well, inquiries into systemic unlawful discrimination. We can inquire into lots of stuff, but when it comes to the sorts of things that emerge from the complaints arena, um, we don't have the ability to do that as such as a head of power. So we've advocated for that as a general power. Um, one other thing, if I could just add it in while I've um, got the bat on, in, in relation to non-disclosure agreements and also um, the data, the need for data, the need for stats, the need for things, uh, tracking the, the, the record of cases and so on that come through um, uh, the complaints handling. There is a big handbrake and it's one of the things that needs to go in the, in the federal area, and that's the secrecy provision. Um, in the work I did at the Law Reform Commission, we looked at the secrecy provisions of the Commonwealth. And, and one of the secrecy provisions was the one in the Human Rights Commission Act. So not only is the, the conciliation operated in a con confidential arena, but we've got a secrecy provision as well. So our, um, our staff are exposed to a criminal provision if they talk too much um, about the detail. So even for, for uh, anonymized stats, that's a real chiller. So, you know, there are some practical things that are really desperately needed. 
that haven't come up very much in the, the wider discussion, I just happened to carry with me. Um, in Beth, you, you described my, my background. While it's not been distinctly a human rights background, it's been the, the kind of magnetic, um, you know, the magnetic pull of a whole lot of stuff um, over the years, which um, um, can be repurposed in, in a, in mm. a skill set. You know, you, you, you pour in the knowledge, but you, you draw from the, the, the various things you've done. And, and the secrecy provision is one that I think has got to go. Mm. Um, but, but I would also just caution, just keep in mind the really distinct way. Fair Work talks about hours of work and wages and things like that. We talk about and deal with the really hard stuff of interpersonal reaction of actions. Thank you, Ros. Would anyone else on the panel like to comment? One. Thank you. I think in terms of using um, uh, occupational health and safety structures, particularly, they, they are of great value in the proactive and preventative approach. Um, in Victoria, we are getting some psychological health regulations put in to, to define um, and, and assist um, the, the regulator um, and maybe workers and their representatives to understand what the risks are and then the, the action of identifying the risks and then identifying ways to, to prevent the risks um, can be a very powerful mechanism. It's not a mechanism that, that uh, um, supplants individual rights mechanisms. So where there is an actual act of discrimination, um, then, then the individual rights mechanism can still operate, but using um, using workplace representatives and the structures that the, the OHS Act um, uh, puts in place, so having a health and safety representative in the workplace, if it's a large workplace, having multiple health and safety representatives that deal with particular um, areas of work to then think about the particular problems, whether physical or psychological, um, that might arise, and then pl planning through committees and meetings how to deal with that. That's one aspect of the, the workplace health and safety laws that could be really powerful in how to address um, and prevent discrimination from happening before it causes harm. Um, and then, you know, work, work safe Victoria at, at least have so many more inspectors that can get out on the ground and answer the call. Um, they, they, they're, they're much better answering the call for physical um, hazards, um, but maybe with the new new psychological um, health regs um, and greater training, they will answer the call for psychological hazards too. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm very hopeful of the workplace health and safety mechanisms to, to be a preventative um, and to complement our equality laws. Thanks, Swan. Um, did Andrew or Tony want to have a comment, want to comment on that? Okay. Um, I see that we've reached our um, 6.15, which is our closing time. Um, so uh, I think I better draw this to a close. Um, I'm sorry that we ended up with such little time for questions because it, it is, they're a really fascinating set of issues and it's great to get this panel together to talk from all the different perspectives um, and for Alicia's book to be the, um, the, um, the mechanism to um, put this information out for everybody to use and respond to as well. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody for the panel, particularly for speaking. Um, all the participants for attending, and Alicia particularly for the book, um, which we now consider to be launched. Um, so thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>